It is, it, it is lovely to be here with you again. And um, before I move into the, this whole small passage, I just want to say the little verse that says, greet one another with a kiss of love, is not just about a kiss on the cheek or a kiss on the lips or a hug. I think it's to do with what David was saying. The love and affection you get from church family that is quite unique. You don't find it anywhere else. You don't often find it in a big church. But here, in a small church, is that deep fellowship that makes all the difference. Thank you, David. So we've got three little verses that finish off the book of 1 Peter. And I first want to look at this, the characters that he talks about. He talks about Silas or Sylvanus who was a Hellenistic Jew and also a Roman citizen. He was also a church leader with teaching and prophetic gifts. He accompanied Paul on his second missionary journey and he was in prison with him in Philippi. Now here we have him with Peter, probably in Rome. He ministered with Timothy in Berea. He also spent time in Corinth. You know, this was a well-traveled man. He'd been ministering to God, for God, in various different places. And here he is helping Peter write um, what could have been Peter's last letter. We know it wasn't, but it could have been. Then we have Mark. Mark, who wrote the book of Mark, probably at Peter's dictation. Mark, who probably came from Libya, from Cyrene, probably African, certainly Jewish, certainly from a Levitical family. His father was probably called Aristopolis, and his mother was definitely called Mary, because we know that the church met in her house and was there praying when Peter was released from prison. So Mark comes from a good Jewish Christian church family. And tradition has it that he helped to start the church in Alexandria, the Coptic church from which the gospel spread throughout the whole of Egypt. So a big man in church history. And then we have this little phrase, she who is in Babylon. What does that mean? As you can imagine, there's loads of conjecture about who this could possibly be. Now, this is my opinion. I don't think it was a person. I think Babylon tells us that Peter was writing from Rome, which was the, as it were, the first century Babylon, which was the center of um, idol worship, temples to Ishtar, temples to Marduk. Rome was... Um, the center of Roman power. It was a place of great political power, great riches, dreadful debauchery, loads of idolatry. And here was Peter ministering in the church in Rome. And I think when he says, she who is in Babylon, it suggests that he's saying the church in Rome was keeping a, a low profile. And he was sending greetings. I don't know. But we have missionary friends who, when they send emails and letters, have to be very careful about the words they use when they're writing from Muslim countries. And you have to be very careful that you um, use sort of euphemisms for God or church or, or fellowship. And this may have been it. So we have some characters now, the more I thought about it, the more it challenged me. You know, here were early Christians who traveled for God. When you think of missionaries in the New Testament, it's easy. We think of Paul 
And maybe we think of Silas, who travelled with him a bit, or maybe Barnabas. But do you know, I think they all travelled. We know that out of the apostles, Andrew went to Georgia and Bulgaria, Nathaniel went to Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and eventually India. They didn't have EasyJet. They didn't have trains. They just traveled for God. Matthew went to Iran. Philip went to Turkey. Thaddeus went to Greece, Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey. And Thomas went to Kandahar, and then he went on into India, established the church in Kerala amongst the Jewish people there, and he even went to China. What a challenge. What a challenge. It's so easy. You know, I mean, I went to Rwanda in January. That was a big deal. I went for three weeks and I came home again, back to my comfortable bed, you know. But I found this that was really interesting, that the Romans did more to facilitate travel than any other empire. They built major roads, they cleared the seas of pirates. Seriously, they cleared the seas of pirates. It took three years, but they had squadrons of um, boats patrolling the seas. Until the invention of the steam engine, there was no time easier to travel than in Paul's day. What a gift from God that he made it possible. The Pax Romana, or the Roman peace, declared by Emperor Augustus, enabled people like Paul to travel relatively safely in the first century. Epictetus, the Stoic philosopher, wrote, there are neither wars nor battles, nor great robberies, nor piracies, but we may travel at all hours and sail from east to west. And William Ramsey, who was... Do you know about William Ramsey? He was a, um, an archaeologist. And he went to the Middle East to disprove Luke's account in Luke and in Acts. And he went and he was completely baffled because every detail that Luke wrote was correct. And he himself became a Christian. He wrote, the Roman words were probably at their best during the first century after Augustus had put an end to war and disorder. Paul and other Christians travelled in the best and safest period. Isn't that interesting? Um, it wasn't easy. You've only got to read Acts 27 and part of 28 to realise that sailing from um, Israel to Rome was a major effort, depending on the tides, the winds, the time of the year, um, and all sorts of things. I mean, Paul had an eventful journey, but he was so committed to serving God. And I found this that really challenged me. Irenaeus, I don't know about him, he's the bishop of, he was the Bishop of Lyon, and he wrote this in um, 177 AD. It's old English, but listen to it. It says such a lot. The church throughout the whole world, even to the ends of the earth, that's as far as they knew it then in the second century, has received from the apostles and their disciples this preaching and this faith and carefully preserved it. She also believes this points and she proclaims them and she teaches them and she brings them down harmony as if she only as if she possessed only one mouth for although the languages of the world are dissimilar yet the import of the tradition is one and the same for the churches which have been planted in germany do not believe or hand down anything different nor do those in spain nor those in gaul nor those in the east nor those in egypt nor those in libya nor those which have been established in the central regions of the world. Which says to me that these apostles and disciples travelled to the ends of their known world. They were obedient to Jesus when he said, go. 
and preached to all nations. And they kept to the central truths of the gospel. And here we are, here we are with so many denominations and religious groups that you, you don't know necessarily what's right and what's wrong. And people largely who leave missionary work to the few. What a challenge for us today. And the other thing about this passage is that it brings to an end Paul's and um, Peter's first letter. He wrote it towards the end of his life. He wrote it while there was major persecution in Rome. He wrote it when he didn't know how much longer he had. But this letter finishes well. And so my second thought, I don't know what's happened. It keeps kicking out, doesn't it? Um, my second challenge is to do with finishing well. Now, this week is almost the end, if not the end of the school term, the school year. We have seen the end of a Tory government. We have come to the end of Wimbledon. We will be at the end of the football by midnight tonight. And the challenge is to finish well. I was very moved when I saw Rishi Sunak outside Downing Street. I hope you were too. He wrote that he said this to the country. I would like to say first and foremost, I am sorry. I have given this job my all, but you have sent a clear signal that the government of the United Kingdom has changed and yours is the only judgment that matters. I have heard your anger, your disappointment, and I take responsibility for this loss. What a humble way to finish. How gracious when so many have stood there and not been humble and gracious. And I found Martin Luther's last speech. Now, he didn't know it was his last speech. It was the night before he was assassinated in April 1968. And he wrote, he said this. I have not got his accent, okay? I'm not the right colour. But just imagine that this is Martin Luther King. He said, we've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. What a way to go. What a faith he had in where he was going, almighty God. And so I just want to spend a few minutes looking at two characters from the Old Testament. One who finished well and one who didn't. So the first one is Gideon. Now, I'm sure... We all know about Gideon. Gideon was a very reluctant leader. He didn't want to lead his people. And it took him a lot of um, discussion with God as to whether he could lead his people. But he did. He did. And God called him to reduce the size of his army down to 300. And then he gave him a strategy that would... Um, basically defeat the hordes of Midian and the Amalekites and the other armies that are gathered to attack Israel. The story is amazing. The middle of the night when these 300 men 
um, broke their pictures, threw their torches in the air and shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And the enemy army was routed and God's people triumphed. Now what happened to Gideon? Do you know? We read this in Judges 8. The Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Now that was good. That was really good. And then he said this, I do have one request. Each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. They answered, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment and each of them threw a ring from his plunder into it. It says that the Ishmaelites used to wear gold rings in their ears, the soldiers. Um, so the weight of the gold rings came to 1,700 shekels, which is 20 kg, which is quite a lot of gold. And what did Gideon do with it? He made a gold ephod, nobody's quite sure what that means, which he placed in Ophra, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshipping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. How incredibly sad that a man who started so well eventually led the people of God idolatry. Now, you don't have to look far to find stories of Christian leaders who've gone wrong. Christian leaders who've made mistakes. Christian leaders who've got snared by power or by riches or by sex. Christian leaders who have abused or done other things. The challenge is to remain faithful. And my next character is Moses. Moses, who really shouldn't have survived. He should have been killed along with the other Israelite babies. But God saved his life and he grew up um, the adopted daughter of Pharaoh's, the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. And you know the story. You know the story. How he tried to intercede for his Israelite brothers and was banished to Midian. How he became a shepherd on the um, mountain of God and met God in a bush that was on fire but not burning and eventually led the people of Israel out of Egypt took them through the desert for 40 years until at the age of 120, he stood with a couple of million Israelites ready to go into the promised land. And he said this in Deuteronomy 31, Moses went out and he spoke these words to Israel. I'm now 120 years old and I am no longer able to lead you. The Lord has said to me, you shall not cross the Jordan. The Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. He will destroy these nations before you and you will take possession of their land. And then he gave them instructions about following Joshua. And he said, follow God, keep true to God. Go and fulfill all that God has commanded in taking this land. And in chapter 34, we find, this is such a moving passage. Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah across from Jericho. And there God was. The Lord showed him the whole land. The Lord said, this is the land I'm going to give the people. From the north up there, right down to the south in the Negev, all the way from the Mediterranean Sea to the other side of the Jordan. 
that is going to be my land. That is going to be the land that your people will take. That is going to be the land that will be forever the land that belongs to Israel. That is why they are still disputing it. That's why there will never be full, complete fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses, until the whole land belongs to God's people. But he said to Moses, I'm going to do it. You're not going to lead them in there, but I'm going to do it. The Lord said, <clears throat> This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. He buried him in Moab. How amazing is that? That God buried him. God buried him in Moab, in the valley opposite Beth Peor. But to this day, no one knows where his grave is. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. And he was still in the same sandals and still in the same clothes with which he came out of Egypt because God kept everything from wearing out for the whole of those 40 years. Moses kept going till the very end. He didn't let the disappointment of not leading the people into Israel diminish him and diminish his faith one tiny bit. He was faithful to God and he trusted that what God um, had said was right. The Bible is full of people who finished well. Paul finished well. Paul wrote this in 2 Timothy. I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. The time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. So this is the challenge, I believe, for us today. To make sure that we finish well. We don't know how long we have. But the challenge is to remain faithful to God and his truths. To be people of the word to be able to discern truth from error and truth from fudge truth and wishy-washiness, which is so easy. To finish well, maybe we have got unfinished business. Have you written your will? Have you cleared out your attic? <laughs> have you forgiven old grievances? Is there stuff that you would do today if you knew you didn't have tomorrow? That's a challenge. As we look into the future, what are we basing our trust on? On life insurance, savings in the bank, Savings under your bed, a, gen a generous pension, good health, or are we putting our faith in God himself? Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you for these last few verses in the book of 1 Peter. Lord, I pray that we will be people who finish well in our walk with you. I pray that we will be quick to sort things out that need sorting out. I pray, Lord, that we will remain faithful until our very last breath. 
So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching with Church Baptist Church YouTube. If you're new to our channel, why not subscribe? That way you can know when we post new content. Make sure you leave us a comment. Let us know how we can pray for you, what spoke to you today, and where you're writing from. And also share these messages with one of your friends if you find them encouraging and inspiring in any way. Hey, listen, if you're able to, why not join us in one of our services at our physical location? All our details are on the website. I'll see you there. God bless you.